Samuel Corcoran, I'm one of the pastors here. And Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, half of you are excited. Okay, one more time. Merry Christmas, everybody. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for Christmas time. But if you're here for the first time, someone brought you, if you came as an invitation, or if you're someone that's like tricked you to come to church, thought you were going to watch a movie, but now you're in a nightclub, kind of weird. You're welcome, by the way. And uh, as Lighthouse, we are a church. We exist for all people. Um, and we always say here, no perfect people allowed, because there is no such thing as perfect people. We all know this. Uh, but this is a place where everyone can come and be themselves. And as Lighthouse, we want to create a church where you can belong before you can believe. You can find community. You can find people who, who you can talk to, who you can connect with. You can find your best friends, your future spouse maybe, I don't know, um, here uh, as well. But really the whole idea of church that we're actually a family who do life together. And uh, we're a church that's for the community. For Navin, we love this town, we're all about this town, and actually speaking of town, our, we have a team, we don't really see them, they're called our care team, and they do a fantastic job behind the scenes, they're like our ninja uh, uh, warriors on our team, but this Christmas, you know, come on, like we, many of us here are pretty much sorted for Christmas, we're blessed, the turkey's probably bought, or you're going to collect it on Tuesday, or, or, or yeah, Tuesday, um, but you know there's people around us who don't have a lot this Christmas. They don't have a lot of food, don't have heating, don't have shelter. And there are people around us who are in a lot of need. And as a church, we don't want to be someone on the sidelines going, oh, look at those people, they're suffering, they're in need. No, no. We want to be the people who are in the middle of that need. Amen. We want to be able to help. So we have, we have had, had a team of people who collectively gather uh, hampers for those in need in our community. Um, but as well... What we've done is, is uh, we've also taken time last Saturday to go to the Navin Shop Center and wrap some gifts in aid of the Navin Alzheimer's Society to raise some money. So what we do, we, we, we've raised some money. We have a check here. So my check's over there if someone hands it me. Um, we should have some presented. But we have a check. Is Peter coming? Peter. Peter should be here. Come on, Peter Brady. Let's put our hands together for Peter Brady. You can hear him before you see him. So we have a team of people who basically planned this event in Navin uh, Shop Center where basically what we did, we, ripped, we wrapped some gifts for people. Uh, ripped, not ripped, wrapped. Some of you can't even rip gifts as we see. Um, but took in time and people donated generously uh, to the amazing cause of the Alzheimer's Society. So we got Peter Elf Brady here. Um, this is what he wears on Sundays. Um, and Peter's on the board with the Alzheimer's Society and also part of our church. And Peter, you know firsthand the great, great work that the Alzheimer's Society do. Um, Sarah's mom, your wife, mother-in-law, uh, is going through that. Now, come on up here, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah might be part of this too. Come on. Um, I, you know, as a church, you know, we, we, are, we are a charity, but we want to help other charities. We want to help other people. So, so we are so grateful and so thankful we're going to be able to help and be a part of the Alzheimer's Society. So we're giving you guys 500 euro to the Alzheimer's Society. Bam, bam, bless you. There you are, Peter Brady, for the Alzheimer's Society. Thank you so much for what you do. Seriously, you're amazing. Appreciate you. Thank you much. Oh, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'll see you later on, Sarah. Ah, oh, lads, it's great. But hey, we want to be a church that's generous. We want to bless the community. That's what we're all about uh, at Lighthouse. But hey, so we have been doing something called Christmas at the Movies. Have you been enjoying your popcorn? Have you had your Cokes open yet? Are you waiting for me? Can I have a Coke? Can I have a Coke so I can up with you? Thank you so much. Okay, here's what we're going to do. On a count of three, we're all going to open up our can of Cokes already. And I'm sorry if you already opened your can. That's your own fault. Already? One, two, three. Ah, I broke a nail. Here, Grace. Oh, no, it's yours. Sorry, bro. <laughs> Grace got like five cans over there. <laughs> so we've been doing something, uh, basically a series called Christmas at the Movie. So the first week we showed the movie Miracle on 34th Street. And that, really the whole idea of that movie was believing. Uh, and seeing is not believing, but believing is seeing. And very creatively, you're going to see today, we're going to take snippets of movie and kind of bring it from the point of the movie into what it may say in the Bible and how it's relevant to our lives today. And the second week, we did the movie Home Alone. Kevin! Best movie of all time. And last week, we did Art or Christmas. But this week, everybody, drum roll, please, drum roll. This week, we're showing the movie Elf. Come on. Elf, it's going to be a great movie, great movie. So basically, to give you some context about this movie. The film centers on Buddy, a human who was adopted and raised by Santa's elves. He learns about this and heads to New York City to meet his biological father while also spreading Christmas cheer in the world of cynics in the 
process. So before I get into the first clip, here's what I want to kind of talk about first of all. Christmas is great, isn't it? Christmas is great for a lot of things. One of the things with Christmas is great because number one, we get time off. Praise God. We actually get a day off or some time off with the family. Uh, we get to spend time with the family and friends. We have to be able to kind of pause and stop and kind of be with our family and be with our friends, be with our loved ones. A lot of cheer, a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. And more importantly, a lot of food. Come on, a lot of food. Christmas is a great time just to pause. But at the same time, Christmas cannot be that great either. For the same reason, some people would say Christmas isn't great because we have too much time off. <laughs> or, you're, or, people ha- or people don't think Christmas is great because you have to spend time with those who you don't want to spend time with at Christmas time. Like, oh no, that one time of the year where I have to tolerate that one person in my family who I don't like, because it's Christmas, I'll tolerate them. Or maybe it's just because it's too cheer. People are too fake. Oh, people are just being nice because it's Christmas time, but they're all fake. Or, oh, the turkey, who likes turkey? It's too bland anyway. What's the point of eating it? you got to like smother it in gravy and bread sauce before you even like it. But Christmas is one of those things where it's either great for somebody or not great for somebody. And I think about Christmas time as well. It's one of those times in the year where the, the, the kind of phrase naughty list, you know, who, who's going to be naughty, who's going to be good, uh, it comes up all the time. And we all know in Christmas time, you know, if you're on the naughty list, you're getting a sack of coal. You're getting a little bit of coal, that's it. And it's one of those fra- expressions and phrases that we use at Christmas time. Oh, you know, naughty people don't deserve presents, right? If you're being naughty, you don't deserve presents, you don't deserve gifts. And it's fascinating if you kind of flip that towards church. And if you're here today and if you're a skeptic, you're not someone who has a, a, a faith or a belief, maybe you're thinking the same thing when it comes to God. You know, God is God's like Santa. We're like, have to be good. Have to be, have to get on the good list first to get anything from God. And the reality is, look, we all know we're naughty. Come on. We all know we're no, like no one. So like even then already from the beginning of, 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 our, of our walking on this earth, we already think, man, there's a big separation between us and God because we can never be too good. We can never be too perfect. Why? Because naughty people don't deserve nice presents. And more for us in the church, we feel like naughty people don't deserve to have a relationship with God. Or maybe here, I don't deserve to be in this church. Just, I'm in a church, oh my goodness, but by the way, you didn't burn, thank God, right? <laughs> I thought when I was young, if I walked through church doors, I would burn because I was so bad, I was so bold. But growing up in a certain religion, that's how I thought about God. If I was naughty, if I was living a certain way, if, you know, it's too, I'm gone too far. God could never love someone like me. I'm a mess. I'm from Carlo, by the way. There's a lot of messed up things happening in Carlo Town. I'm just saying, okay? But the idea is that, man, when it comes to church and faith, it's like we, we, we're, we're gone too far. We're gone too far. God, God can't do anything in my life. God can't even love someone like me. Do you know what I did? Well, he does. He does. He does. And my, my hope at the end of this message is somewhat to flip that, that perspective that you have, that maybe, just maybe, that at, at the end of this message, that you would actually realize that it's not about you being naughty, it's about God being good. Amen? So we're going to show our first clip now. We're going to turn our eyes to the screen. There's a famous story in the Bible, and you may know it, you may not know it. It's called The Prodigal Son. And movies have been made about it. Songs are even being made about it. But it's one of those famous stories that even non-Christians, even you know, secular society knows about it because it's just become so popular. But actually, I want to take a few moments to look at that whole story because I do believe with this film and what I'm talking about, actually, it kind of makes sense. And actually, I, f- I do believe as we land this message today, we're asking you a question about do you believe God really loves you is the idea that actually you can never be too far gone or you can never be too, too long on the naughty list for God to uh, come into your life. So I want to look at uh, the cha- uh, book of Luke, uh, chapter 15, verse 11, 24. Luke is in the New Testament, so we've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is the third Gospel. And what's happening here is Jesus is talking to a group of people. And these people are quite religious. They're quite kind of like, you know, they're kind of w- it weirded out the fact that Jesus, who's supposed to be God, is hanging around with people who, who let's just say you wouldn't see them in church. And these religious leaders were kind of upset with the fact that Jesus was hanging out with them, the, the, the sinners, you want to call it from the to text, and not with the religious leaders. And of course, Jesus being so savage the way he is, hears that and goes, well, let me tell you three stories. And the first story is the whole story of the lost sheep. And about the whole reason why, why how, how a farmer would leave 99 to go after the one because one sheep is important. That's a story illustrating about someone that, that, that one person means everything to God. And the second story is a lost coin about a, a woman in a household looking for a coin because at the time that coin was quite significant 
for so many reasons and she found a coin but she stopped everything to find that coin and the third story that Jesus is trying to illustrate is this, this is the story of the lost son the prodigal son and I want you to understand that in this text we're looking at, at, at basically two characters the father and the son and with the movie we have the father and the son we want to kind of somewhat reverse it with the movie the father is the son and the scripture's his son is the father. That makes sense? Just keep up, with you, keep up with me, right? Okay, so verses 11 to 12. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Say two sons. Two sons. Come on, say two sons. two sons. The younger one said to his father, father or father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Verse two verses. What does that even mean? So the son's asking for his inheritance. What does that really mean? So the son is saying, da, I wish you were dead. Give me your money. Because you know inheritance, you don't get it until someone's dead. It's inheritance. But here's a son coming to his father saying, Hey dad, listen, I don't, I, I don't want to wait around till you die because I think it's going to be a couple of more years. Tell you what, give me my share now and I will move on. Like here is the height of disrespect as a son to a father saying, Hey, I wish you would die. Please give me all that is owed to me. And this son you know, he, he had lost his way. He had got distracted some way. Uh, but they're thinking, you know, the best thing I can do with my life is to get my, in my inheritance and go live the way that I wanted to live. And he made a very selfish uh, choice. He made a selfish choice. And unfortunately, selfish choices can lead to suffering consequences. He wasn't thinking about the fact that what happens, he spends all his inheritance. What happens then? He's now tarnished a whole relationship with his father. But because he was so selfish and because he somewhat wanted what he wanted right there and then, he goes, give me my inheritance. I want it now. And here's the thing. A bad choice doesn't make a person bad. But a lot of bad choices can make someone bad. And the reality is with this son... We can be like that as well at times where we're, we want something now. Like we live in the microwave society. There used to be a time where it was the cock, you know, like the slow cooker society where like we would be so calm and so relaxed and wouldn't be as you know, upbeat and fast. But today because of culture, because of social media and technology, we are 110 miles an hour. Like microwave's not even fast enough anymore. Like literally not even fast enough. Like we go to McDonald's, the food's made in six seconds and still we're not happy. Because it's too slow. Hurry up, hurry up. So we live in a culture where we, so everything has to be fast and sped up. And even in our expectations, especially here if you're in school, you're in college, or you have a business, you just want everything to work now as it is. But the problem is, is that sometimes we make selfish decisions that have massive consequences that can actually tarnish our relationship with our loved ones, with our family, with our friends, in our business, in our school, in our college. Because right then we have a need that we want to fulfill now. Even to the point where we'll say to our own father or our own mother or our own siblings or our own spouse saying, I wish you were dead. Give me what is owed to me. We can all lose our way in life. Even if today if you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower, or not a Christ follower, it is so easy to lose your way in life. And that's the thing about life. Life actually kicks us off track. The purpose of life is not to keep you on track, because life is life. Come on, we don't have a perfect life. Life is life. It's already difficult as it is. Why should we make it any harder for ourselves? So in reality, for, in our own lives, that sometimes we make some, some, some decisions that are quite selfless, self, selfish, to be honest, that can lead to some devastating consequences where now we're like, man, where's my family? Where are my loved ones? Or even where's God? And maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian home. Maybe you did. But maybe throughout your life, you've been kind of thinking about God in church and is it even relevant? Is God real? What's the point of all this? Even then, maybe asking the question, man, where's God in my life? Have I made some decisions that have pushed me away from God? Have people kind of encouraged me or kind of forced me to move away from God because of decisions that they made? But maybe today the question I want to ask is, man, where is God in my life? And is God real? And, does, and, and, and if he is real, what does that mean to me? Okay, let's look at our second clip. So as the story goes then, the son asks dad for his inheritance. Look, give it to me all. I deserve it. And he takes it. <clears throat> I pick up then from, from verse 13. It says this, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country far, far away. And he squandered all his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to become need, in, in need. Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that, that country who sent him uh, to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were feeding from but no one gave him anything. Now, some context, right? So we're looking 
Jesus came to Israel at a time when people were predominantly Jewish, okay? And there were very strong traditions and cultures in Judaism, right? And the first, one of the big things, first of all, is you don't ask your dad for your inheritance, which is a big no-no. Second thing is, you never go to another country and become a slave. That's a massive no-no in the culture of Judaism. Because just how they say slaves and all, you do not become a slave. So not only is a son, you know, being despised his own father and, and basically humiliated his whole family. Now he went to another country, squandered all his wealth on, on prostitutes and, and other things like gambling, they said. And then literally became a slave. And then also, Jew, Jewish people don't eat pigs. Don't want to be around pigs. They see pigs as like really bad animals. So where is he working? In a pig farm. And there he is longing to eat pig food, but he can't even eat that. But can you imagine the, this guy in the mom, but how he, he realized, man, I really messed up. I really made a mistake this time. I think this is something that's real for all of us. What we expect is often not what we get from life. Like, for example, you know, when you start your career, you expect a great career. You, you go to college, you get what you need to get done, you get your degree, your master's, and maybe you launch a business or a few businesses, but you have an expectation of how you want it to go, but 10 years later, you look back going, this is not what I expected. I'm in a ton of debt, I can't pay my mortgage, I can't feed my kids, or I can't do this. I, don't, I, 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 I just didn't expect this. Maybe marriage. Maybe you got married, I didn't expect that you're going to be married for the rest of your life. <laughs> and the same person will be beside you until you die. But see, here's the reality about marriage. Everyone's preparing for a wedding, but not for a marriage. Everyone prepares for a day, but not for a lifelong time together. See, what we expect isn't really what we get. Or maybe it's, it's our dreams. Maybe today you have dreams. We all have dreams. But as you get older, again, life can kick dreams out of you. And people say, oh, man, this, this is going to cop on. Get, come back down to reality. There's no point dreaming. You can't do that. What's the point? And again, you grew up, or maybe you have this dream, but people keep saying you can't do it. And you get to a point, you go, what, what's the point? Why do I even bother? Because reality is what we expect is often not what we get from life. Let's turn our eyes now to the third clip. So we continue on with the story in verse 17, but the son, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's higher servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He's definitely Irish. Definitely starving to death. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Basically, I have humili I've humiliated you. I've hurt you. I've torn his family apart. I'm sorry. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me one of your hired servants. So the son comes to his sense and realizes, man, my father's servants in his house live a better life than what I'm living now. He came to realize that it's better to be a servant in his own home and to be living in a distant land trying to feed pigs. And here's the thing. Knowing how to make things right is not difficult. Come on, we know there are some relationships in our lives or some things in our own lives that we know that we should make them right. That's not the hard part. The hard part is doing what you know to make things right. That's the hard thing. And maybe, you know, kind of Christmas is one of those times of the year where really they illuminate relationships where either they're going really well or they're strong or really this is broken down and they're going nowhere. And maybe in your marriage or maybe a sibling or someone in your life who you just know that every Christmas you have to tolerate them. But Christmas always reminds you that you're not, you're not even. You're not in a good place together. And it's just that time of the year where you put on a mask and, and you become fake for the sake of people in your family and people around you. But the reality is we all know what to do. But the question is, will we do it? And the son did this. He realized, I need to go back to my father. And humble myself and say, Dad, I realize I did, I did wrong. I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy to be part of this family. I know I want you, and I know you want me out of your life. But please, can I come back as a servant? See, bad choices don't, doesn't make a person bad. But bad choices can make a bad person. And again, it's that point that so many, too many or so many bad choices can lead to us getting into a bad place in life. But I want to encourage you, no matter how many bad choices you make, you're never too far away from God. Okay, let's look at the fourth clip. So the son, knowing what he needs to do, he gets up and he goes back to his father. In verse 20 it says, But while he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and was filled with compassion, not anger, with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Verse 21. The son said to him, now the son had a speech prepared. He was like, can you imagine? He's walking back to his dad. His parents had a speech. said, okay, this speech is going to help me become a slave. I'm going to say it. So the son says this. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before the father even lets him finish his sentence, he, go, he calls his servant and says, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate because the lost son came home. There is so much symbolism in these couple of verses that I really want to point out to you. Because I think we can just read this and go, oh, that's such a cute story. Son came home, dad go them, great. But there is so much, there's this incredible uh, truth in this. Number one, again, in, 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 in the Jewish culture, men did not run. Men of high prestige never ran. You want to know why? Because men wore skirts. Not a good day. <laughs> it never ran. And can you imagine them trying to run? Like, whoop, I'm coming, son. Like, it's not the coolest thing you want to be doing as a man, right? But this was the culture. This was tradition. But he didn't care about culture. He didn't care about traditions. He didn't care about anything. He saw his son from a distance, and he just ran. And he just ran towards his son. Because he missed him, and he was filled with compassion. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son comes up with a speech about, the, about that. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But before the son even finishes what he's saying, the dad calls all his servants. says, let's throw a party. My son is home. See, the son thought he was going back to the father. But in reality, it was the father who was running towards his son. So this whole topic or theme here is called Father's Love. And the symbolism of Father's Love is the robe. You see here, he put a robe on his son. What does robe mean? Robe basically means he clothed him with dignity and covered his shame. Can you imagine how ashamed his son felt? Dad, I embarrassed you publicly as as, as my father, as a family. I spent all my wealth. I went to a, a far country and I became a slave with pigs. Can you imagine how ashamed he felt? But his father did not address that shame. He covered it and he gave him a robe. A ring. A ring is to confer on him authority and to restore to him his identity. He goes, you are not a slave or a servant. You are my son. You are my daughter. And third thing is sandals. Sandals are a sign of protection and provision that God will make away. And in a fattened calf, a sign of the father's fate and confidence for his lost son to come home. Now some theologians and scholars would, would debate that, the, why would he ask for a fattened calf? Well, some would say this, it's, not, it's just all like, you know, you know kind of questions and, and all thinking about what, what, what's, what's the truth. But some theologians would say, as soon as the son left, the father said, okay, this calf here, I'm going to put that aside. Because one day my son will come home. And when he does come home, this calf will be barbecued. That's what people are so, but still, it's a beautiful image, right? The father had faith in his son that he'd come back and say, you know what, we're going to keep this fattened calf here for my son. Because I do believe one day that he will come home. And we notice, he comes home. And they get the fattened calf. A hug is to say, son, not a slave, accepted and not alienated. And a kiss is that you can never, ever out sin or outrun my love for you. And this is what the nativity story is. This, so this is Jesus telling the story to these religious leaders. And here's Jesus trying to say, do you not get it? This story is about God and mankind. That the father is God. And, 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 the, and the son is all of us. And in some way or another, we've all you know, veered off on our paths. We've all done things that we're ashamed of, that we're quite embarrassed, that we wish that were never done. And because the naughty list, and because you've got to be perfect, you can't bring it to God. But God is saying, listen, come to me. I will robe you. I'll put a ring on. I, I, I will not address your shame, but I will make you who have called you to be. And this is the reason of the nativity story. It's what it's all about. Jesus came to show us the way to the Father. He said, hey, I've come so you can have access to God. He loves you. See, God's not mad about you, but he's madly in love with you. God, God's not angry at you, but he's mad about you. God wants you in his life. He cares about you. This whole story of the son is that the father with compassion was waiting eagerly for the son to come 
come home. To come home to him. And the whole reason why we celebrate Christmas and the nativity is Jesus coming to the earth to give us an opportunity to have access to God so that we could have a relationship with Jesus. That all the sins, all the things that we've done in our past, in our present and the future will be covered because of what Jesus did on the cross. Here's my main point for today. If you're, if you're like me and you just need one sentence to summarize the whole message. Here's my, here's my main point. Jesus didn't come to make naughty people nice. I'm sorry, but he didn't. Jesus did not come to make naughty people nice. Jesus came to make lost people found. He came so that those who are lost can be found. Now, I don't mean like geographically lost. Like I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure you all know where you are, right? We're in heaven, it's one lane. But spiritually lost. The fact that you're, we're not connected to God. And the reason why we, we, we as creation were, 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 were existed to be with the creator, that we were, we were created to be in a relationship with God, but because of life and because of situations and circumstances that has pushed us away from God, and we've become lost spiritually, we've become depressed, we've become so lonely, there's a void in our life that we know we try different things, substance, alcohol, gambling, you name it, five holidays a year, a lip job, whatever you want to do. Try fill that void. But you all know there's something in our life that only God can fill. Because he created us. He created you. And no one is too dirty. No one's too shameful. No one is ever too far gone to come back to God. That's my life. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My dad was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. My mom was the same. My parents would leave on a Friday and not come home until Monday. And all we'd eat was Tesco pizza, 50 cents. We had no floors. We had no heating. What we saw was just terrible things growing up. My parents weren't the most best parents in the world. I, didn't, I grew up in a council estate. I did things from 9 to like 16 years of age that I wish I never did, but I did because I was a, a byproduct of my environment. But at 16 years of age, someone invited me to church like this, this one lighthouse on Easter Sunday, where I began to realize that, you know what? I'm dirty. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. But God still loves me. It's, it's, it's not, there's no conditions. It's unconditional. This does not make sense. God's not mad at me. He's mad about me. And this has flipped religion for me. It flipped the whole idea of naughty and nice. Because reality is Jesus did not come to make naughty people nice. He came to make the lost people found. Let's watch this last clip. <laughs> that is the most manliest hug ever. <laughs> but as we land this message today... Um, and thank you for taking time to be here. I want to kind of really land with just, just three groups of people. And the first one is, if you're a Christian here today, and maybe you were brought up in a Christian home, but maybe it's been a long time since you've come back to the Father, and maybe you need to come to a moment like the sun where it's, it's come to your senses and realize, why, why am I settling for pig's food where I have an all-you-can-eat buffet over here with God? See, that's what life does. Life tries to fool us with an illusion that the, what the world has to offer is good, but reality is just scraps. It's just scraps. But what God is offering is, is really what we all need. is a sense of purpose, significance, acceptance. And actually the fact that you know there's a plan for your life, and more important, that actually you are loved by God. So if you're here and you're a Christ follower, maybe you somehow veered away from having a relationship with him, from reading your Bible or coming to church or serving, maybe your step is, is come, come to your senses. Say, you know what, why, why am I settling for this? Where I can have all of this. And all I have to do is walk back to God. That's all it is. And if you're here today and maybe you're a skeptic, you're a non-Christian, you don't have any faith of all, maybe you're an atheist, so glad you're here. But maybe for you, the question I want to ask you is this. is Would you come to God? In knowing in your own life, you've tried certain things and, and you, you've dabbed into some things and you know they're not working. You know they don't fulfill you. You know you don't feel a sense of peace or, or that, you're, that you're who you are. And you, and you keep trying. And at the end of the day, all it is is an empty plastic bag of nothing. And you go, why do I keep ending up back here? Why do I keep, end up, why do I keep making the same mistakes in the same situations all the time? But I wonder what that, what that would mean for you is that is, is you have to invite God into your life. Because maybe the main thing that you're missing 
is a relationship with Jesus. And I want to encourage you. This is not, I'm not going to single you out. This is an intimate moment with you and God because God's here. But maybe you're here today and you think, I'm too far gone, Sam. I'm divorced. Or I did this. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I have a history. I have a record. Here's the thing. God actively pursues those who are the furthest away from him. God has no problem problem going after those who are further away from him. And Jesus in the scriptures sat with the worst of the, <laughs> the worst. Because Jesus was demonstrating, I have come to save those who are lost. I've come to bring those who are lost to the Father. And maybe you're here today and maybe you're, you're thinking about life and about faith and the whole idea of God. Maybe you just want to give it a shot and go, you know what? I'll give it a shot. Nothing else to lose. I've tried everything else. I pray in confidence because knowing my life, I gave it a shot. It works. I truly believe that God can transform your life. God can change your life. I think the best feeling, the best gift that I can give you this Christmas is the gift that you know you are loved for who you are. As you head into next year, 2020, you can walk away where you know God loves you no matter what. He has a plan for your life. And the best thing you can do for your life, for your wife, for your husband, for your kids, is step into a relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, um, what I want you to do in a few minutes or next song, there's little cards in front of your seat called Next Step Cards. I'd love you to fill that in. And there's a couple of boxes and it says, I'm giving my life to Jesus or you know, I'm recommitting my life to Jesus or I just want to help. Please fill that in because as a church, this is where we come alongside you. And begin this journey of, of you figuring out who God is and who you are in the midst of that. And what does that mean for your life and your future? Does that make sense? And finally then, this one. Third one is, come back in January. <laughs> no, we, we are starting a new collection of talks in January called, How Not to Be Your Own Worst Enemy. <laughs> you know about my life? A lot of my mistakes have one common denominator. I made them. Not my wife. I made them. And looking back in my life, there's a lot of things I wish I could change. There's a lot of decisions I wish I could have changed. Because I was my own worst enemy. And I, I, I think for myself and for you as the church, and maybe here if you're not a non-Christian, this is great for you even as well for January, is that how can we not become our own worst enemies, but how can we become our, our own best allies? Like how can we help ourselves make some good decisions in January? Maybe you're in loads of debt. We rerun a course here to help you get out of debt. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. We have people who are committed to help you with your marriage. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're going through a tough time. Maybe you're suicidal. We have people here who want to help you. So maybe your next step is to come back in January and commit. Say, you know what? I want to come and be part of this collection of talks. I want to know how to make better decisions. And more importantly, I want to find some people who I can talk to and be real. And I want to tell you, there are real people in this church who you can talk to. Does that make sense? So I want to invite you to stand. I'm going to land today's message. I'm going to invite the band up as well. I'm just going to say a short prayer. Then this next song is called Reckless Love. And the idea is that, you know, God's love is so reckless, it would wreck through anything. Wreck through religious boundaries, shame, embarrassment, things that you, you, the things that you think that you can't come to God. God's love just goes straight through that. Because he loves you. And if you're comfortable here today, I want to encourage you. Sing along on the screen if you want. Raise your hands if you're comfortable. Clap, whatever. But I want you to just look at these lyrics and, and, and maybe read them and sing them. And, and really just internalize the fact that, man, in that story of the prodigal son, we are the son. I am the son. I am the daughter. And God is the father. And he welcomes me with open arms. Full of compassion. Willing to love me no matter what. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that I love, that I worship. That's the reason why I'm here today, is to tell you there's another way. And the version of, of, of God that you know, it's not the version I know. It's God loves me. And God loves you. I'll finish this. John 3, 16. We see it in Croke Park. We see it all over. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you. For God so loves you. He gave his one and only son so you could have life and life to the full.
Amen. I want to say a prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for Christmas, Lord. I thank you for everyone in this room, Lord. I pray, God, for everyone in this place that they would not feel judged or condemned, but they would feel accepted, Lord. That, God, you love them no matter what. And in this place, no perfect people. We're just ordinary people gathering here looking for an extraordinary God to move in and through our lives. We pray, Father, that you just work in our lives. We, we invite you into our lives. And that next year, Lord, that we look ahead and go, you know what, Lord? We're praying that the next year will be the greatest year. This year is over, but the next year will be the greatest. And the best thing that we can do is put you first. Into next year. In Jesus' name, amen.